Welcome to NASDAQ Trade Talks, where we meet with the top thought leaders and strategists in emerging technologies, digital assets, a regulatory landscape, and capital markets. This segment is presented by Charles Schwab. I'm your host, Jill Melandrino, and joining me on the desk at the NASDAQ Market Site in Times Square, New York City, we have Brandon Scott. He's the mayor of the city of Baltimore, as well as Mark Anthony Thomas, president and CEO of the Greater Baltimore Committee. We're here to discuss where startups, life sciences, cybersecurity, and AI are converging into a multi-billion dollar growth engine. It is great to have the both of you with us. Thank welcome to Trade Talks. Mayor, welcome to New York City, Times Square. Glad to be New back. New York at the NASDAQ market site. Um, you can certainly see where the intersections, where the synergies are, fabulous university system. Uh, tell us more about the initiatives you have going on in Baltimore. Yeah, listen, we, we know that this is a growing thing for us. We have nearly 500 startups in Baltimore anchored in cybersecurity, life sciences, and advanced manufacturing. We think about those startups. They raised $665 million in 2024 alone. Uh, this is about uh, the continued evolution of our city uh, that was once solely a port city, right? Now we have evolved into being this life sciences place where the University of Maryland Biopark has 250,000 square feet of lab ready space. That is uh, how you are a city that is starting to evolve and change. And we're understanding that we have these great institutions there that are uh, spinning out these businesses and it's our job to help us grow. And Mark Anthony has been a great champion of helping us do that. Yeah, I mean, if you think about the intersection of the public-private partnerships, academia, sandboxes, and, and um, really leaning in on key areas such as healthcare, life sciences, cybersecurity, AI, has changed every industry, the way that we live life, and, and you're you're at the you're at the center of it. Yeah, we are, and, and over time, I mean, Baltimore and Maryland are asset rich. What they're focused on now is how do they commercialize more of their innovation? How do we equip every idea with the right tools and the right talent to then scale their business locally? How do we have the right lab space and the right dual usage of technologies, which is a, a focus for the region? so that people can be either a life sciences company or an AI or be at the intersection of both. Yeah, I think it's encouraging that you're working to provide companies with the guidance, the enforcement trends, yeah. um, understanding on protecting the consumers, their clients, organizations, and so forth. So it sounds as if you know, you're really leaning in to support enterprise there. Yeah, we are. So I'll speak to over the last few years, we have selected a few key opportunity areas. One of those being tech with the focus of bio and AI, which is the focus of our federal tech hub designation, which is part of the US CHIPS Act that was passed a few years ago. And so with that, we aligned over $800 million in targeted investments to grow that ecosystem within the region. That said, what you'll see are, are those investments start to really come online. Uh, Johns Hopkins is investing big in AI, uh, the University of Maryland, this schools are investing big. Morgan State, which is one of our premier HBCUs, uh, is spending a ton to scale up their operations to support innovation. And so there's a lot of just infrastructure that is aligned with academia, mm -hmm. but where private sector leaders are playing a key partnership. Well, one of your success stories includes a NASDAQ listed company, Zero Fox. So that's, that, yeah. that is exciting, you know, nearly a $2 billion cybersecurity company that is, um, protecting critical infrastructure and of course for Baltimore your proximity yeah. to this critical infrastructure is key too. Yeah. yeah listen we we know and we have to take advantage of that proximity in every way we can right whether that's from physical but we're right next to DC we're right next to Fort Meade and we have these these companies that are growing out of Hopkins that are growing out of University of Maryland Johns Hopkins Tech Ventures has supported 130 startups and we want to continue to see that grow Blackbird Labs is a 500 million dollar venture a studio spin out of Hopkins research when you have that and you have the defense industry right there it's about capitalizing on all of them understanding what our strengths are and our strengths as Mark Anthony said are the assets we have these assets in these great institutions and the companies that are coming out of them and another asset for us is that proximity of where we are and this is just us helping that to grow yeah I mean that's that's quite an impressive number the amount of startups that have come out of some of these institutions and you were talking about this off camera, Johns Hopkins, there's still room to run there. It's a relatively young program. Yeah, it is. And if anything, we should be where you see Boston, New York, some of the world leaders as far as commercializing and VC funding. And so we're putting the right structure and the right partnerships in place to ensure the companies get the capital they need. That, like I said, startups get that support. 
uh, and then concurrently that we create the commercial environment for there to be more business between our anchor institutions and companies that we want to see uh, scaling and growing within our market. Yeah, so let's have, what are some examples of the life science companies um, or some of the projects that are intriguing to you? Yeah, so he referenced Blackbird Labs, which is was created a few years ago, and it is a, a, a pretty substantial venture investment that's in the heart of Baltimore City. The goal is to really work with founders and companies that are, are being incubated within the current market to not only be their anchor funder, but help them scale within our market and outside of market. And, and so they're probably one of our bigger, more recent investments. You also have Wexford, yep. which is a well-known lab space builder that just opened up uh, a pretty substantial investment at the University of Maryland's uh, Baltimore campus. And so these are new assets that have come online in just the last few years that will better position our companies to grow. Yeah. And I think just, just to add on to what Mark Anthony said, but think about how important it is the city government is talking about Wexford. Uh, Wexford is at 4 MLK. It's a, it's a uh, the latest expansion of University of Maryland's biopark, yeah. uh, which uh, when I was growing up in Baltimore was a part of the city that was very disinvested in. But now you have this, we had to grow it, build a whole new building, which required uh, the city to do some changes to laws and regulationing and zoning. And that's how you can support something like this to ha help it continue to foster and grow. It also benefits the community because it's not just about the jobs in those labs, the yeah. jobs that support that building, the, fo the front the office folks, the folks that are doing security security and it's about really helping us to to grow this market and now we're even uh, working within uh, ourselves in the school system to make sure that we're modernizing what our young people are learning and now CT CTE education especially in CTE schools like the one that I went to right as someone who learned and was a computer programming uh, a trade person in high school to match what's needed out there today so that our young people are more ready and then training uh, folks that are maybe uh, going back to school at our community colleges to do the same thing. Yeah. And that's Can such, I, I'm sorry, Dad. I was going to add too, uh, a few years ago, a program called Upsurge was created by Brown Advisory, mm -hmm. uh, Point Field Partners, and Johns Hopkins to support startup development within Baltimore. That program is now part of the Greater Baltimore Committee. And so we're aligning them with our regional economic development strategy to, for one, make sure we know who the best founders are, make sure we're providing that corporate and mentorship for them and support, and then creating programs that help them scale and grow. Yeah. Um, Mayor, you brought up a great point in terms of investing and investing in people, and whether you're talking about Baltimore specifically or you know, any region, these contribute to the circular economy, upscaling, rescaling for these types of jobs. These are well-paid salary mm -hmm. jobs that go back into the communities, back into the economy. Um, so you, you made the point before, we have to rethink policy and getting these projects online. Um, there's a benefit just, not just because of innovation leadership, but for providing a sustainable economy as well. Yeah, listen, it, it, we have to, cities are always constantly reimagining themselves, mm -hmm. right? And we now know that when you can't be overly reliant on anything. It was a time that Baltimore solely relied on the port and Bethlehem Steel and GM. And then when that went away, neighborhoods suffered. And, that, and we have now this edge and meds and tourism. We have tech, we have all of these things, but we have to be consistently evolving and making sure that our residents that are, are being prepared to evolve with the industry as well. Because that's how you have a continuous support of an industry that is growing, but that's also gonna be changing. And that's something that we got out of the way of doing, but now that we have this great partnership with everyone, we can make sure that we focus on uh, doing that part, but also when things come, right? I was actually, actually the bill for, uh, for MLK where Wexter is, is literally the last bill that I introduced as a council member, right? Mm -hmm. Because we have to be able to do things that, that make your city a better, a better city in every way. And that means shepherding bills, changing laws and policy, zoning, making sure they're permitting, all of those things matter when you talk about growing to scale economies of, of businesses and startups. Yeah, and I think it's a smart way to approach it by sustainability in terms of long term, yeah. but also being able to adapt. Yep. And to your point earlier, when you're reliant on you know one or two companies or a specific industry that doesn't allow you to adapt as yep. you know modern society does, but I think it's also commendable that you're looking at it from grade school. Uh, because providing the right type of education, I'd even still argue getting civics back into the classroom, but that's a conversation for another time. Um, you know, programs um, such as skilling the right way, introducing financial literacy as an example. Yeah. That's how you close that knowledge gap and you give people the skills that they need 
um, you know, it's easier to teach when you're younger because it just becomes part of who you are. You're yeah. blank slate, essentially. Yeah. No, exactly, and we have and we have the institutions to do it. I think that the same way uh, uh, I was in that that class where um, my school, Merville High School, was it's a trade school, right? But it, we had the the tech portions of it, but most of it was still basic auto mechanic and we're evolving even that right even within our own school system now my department of general services does the curriculum for three high schools when it comes to what they're doing with mechanics and things like that and now we're just going to have to continue to evolve that into all of our cte so that every young person that's going to a high school in our city has the ability to work in a track that will mean that they can go out and get a job in some field today not work and get and, and be stuck because what they learn is something that has passed us by four or five years prior to them. Yeah, I mean, even using the mechanic example, right? I mean, for the most part, you have to be a data analyst and electrician, yeah, right? It's, I mean, there, there is yeah. no way to work on cars anymore yeah. under the hood. Yeah. It's all, you know, it's all covered and, you know, you have um, analytical tools and, you know, have to understand these emerging technologies as well as the electrical trade side of it as well as one example. So I think you had um, mentioned before how public, private, academia, they're partnering up to make sure that the right yeah. education is being delivered. Yeah, and I think part of our task is to help policymakers understand where we see trends and that disconnect creates an environment where you're not preparing the workforce for the right opportunities. And I, and I feel we are in a better place to provide that guidance, provide that data, provide sense, which is why he mentioned where we see startups being funded, what trends we're seeing, what industries are they like centered in, because we can then start preparing the education system to provide the talent we want. Yeah. We do overall perform pretty well as far as tech talent. When CBRE lists their tech talent ranking every year, the Baltimore MSA is pretty high ranked in that but there's an opportunity for us to continue to stay competitive. Yeah, and, and Mark Anthony, you bring up an, another excellent point, and you know, if we talk about cyber as an example, yeah. getting, understanding the audience that you're talking to in order to get the buy-in. Yeah. You're gonna talk to educators, policymakers, the community, um, the technicians in very different ways to get that buy-in, and it sounds as if you've made some progress there. Yeah, right? and, I, and, I, and if anything, all, all U.S. states should have some alignment to be more competitive. In Maryland has created a lot of consistency between the work that we're building, the, what the elected officials are taking on, uh, in partnership with our governor and his team. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure Maryland thrives and be competitive in areas like cyber where it's always had a, a competitive edge. But we're looking at quantum, mm -hmm. we're looking at all the new emerging opportunities and how do we put the right conditions in place for companies to invest. Yeah. Which is interesting, Nobel yeah. Peace Prize for Physics was <laughs> awarded to a team of quantum mechanics just this morning, three person yeah. team. So you're clearly looking um, in the right places here. Mayor Scott, to, to wrap up here, whether you're delivering the message to the city of Baltimore, your constituents, policymakers, or just you know any uh, city you know, around the country, what is that message you want to deliver as it relates to education, innovation, and being adaptable? That you have to be adaptable if you're gonna be an innovator. You, you cannot innovate if you're only going to be stuck in the way or stuck in the past. And you cannot uh, do that properly if you're not educating your residents or your citizens or the people that work for you. If you're going to grow and capitalize on any growth opportunity, you have to be able to provide that education. But also, uh, do the tough stuff now. Be uncomfortable. When, you, when we become the best version of ourselves in anything that's worth any salt, it's because someone decided to be uncomfortable and do the hard things now. Build the foundation so that what you're building will last. All right, appreciate both of your insights. Thanks awesome. for joining us on Trade Talks. I'm Joe Malandrino, Global Markets Reporter at NASDAQ.